Well, welcome everybody to episode seven of Circle of Fellows. I'm Shell Holtz. I'll be moderating our panel today. We're talking about the role of organizational communications in corporate social responsibility on today's Hangout. And we have three fellows, and with luck, another one joining us. Uh, but I think what we'll do is start by going around uh, the, the panel so that you can introduce yourselves and make sort of an opening statement about what you think the role of uh, corporate communications is in corporate social responsibility, sort of a broad overview of, of, of your personal perspective. And Marianne, why don't we start with you? Oh, thank you. Sure. Marianne, Marianne McCauley. I'm based in Reno, Nevada. And I think organizational communication has an important role in corporate social responsibility because it's it's often very tightly tied to the activities, interest, and engagement of employees, both engagement in the community and engagement in the company. And from the research I've done, the experience I've had with clients, uh, organizations that really embrace their employees' engagement in the community uh, benefit from that in many ways in terms of productivity, loyalty, um, lower turnover, and that in turn often has a nice impact on the bottom line. Great. Amanda, you're, you're up next. Um, I'm Martin Atwell, based in Pretoria, South Africa. And of um, the role of the communication professional is really to make sure that the story is told. And uh, not only inside the organization, but also to the communities. Because what I often find is that there's a discrepancy between the, the story that goes out out to the, the communities and the one that goes out to the employees. And uh, as often resulting in a conflict of interest, not because of anything, but uh, that the message was not properly told in time and accurately to all the stakeholders. Great, thank you. And uh, Tamara? Hello, uh, Tamara Gillis. I'm an educator and a communications consultant and researcher. And my um, interest in corporate social responsibility has uh, uh, much to do with the reporting of corporate social responsibility, uh, taking off on what Amanda said about the messages that are sent to external audiences, uh, most you know, investors and potential investors. And uh, my current concern is how organizations communicate social responsibility messages to uh, the next generation of investors, the um, millennial generations who are just now thinking about how they will invest their monies. Great. And um, John Devaney, we hope, will be able to join us uh, in a while. He's apparently having some technical challenges uh, getting online, but we'll hear from him if he's able to uh, join us. Uh, I saw a report last week. Uh, this was the Government and Accountability Institute analysis of the S&P 500 index. And uh, what this analysis showed was that uh, when they ran this study back in 2011, 20% of companies were publishing sustainability reports. Uh, in 2015, 81% of companies published sustainability reports. That's a 61% increase in four years, which is, is pretty remarkable, I think. Uh, Tamara, in, in light of the research that you have done, can you maybe talk about why you think there has been this uh, surge in companies doing this kind of reporting? And, and after you share that, we'll talk about how valuable this kind of reporting is. Uh, I think the uh, increase has a lot to do with uh, other research uh, that, that you see on social enterprise investing and uh, more and more investors are interested in supporting companies that they feel are doing good. It's, it's an extension of that uses and gratification idea that their money is going to um, and 
an organization, a company that is is going to uh, do something good with it, as opposed to um, philanthropy, where they might be supporting a cause, but they're not seeing a gener an, a uh, return on their investment. So we see more organizations producing sustainability reports to go hand in hand with their annual report, um, and. Uh, there's also a movement that we're, I hope we'll see more of here in the near future, which is the integrated or the one report where uh, companies will start to report both corporate social responsibility and their annual SEC reporting in one document so that users don't have to search out two different documents to um, explore or investigate potential um, investment opportunities. Yeah, uh, in the press release around this report, uh, the executive VP of, of the GNA Institute, Louis Coppola, uh, said corporate reporters have also become more sophisticated in the disclosure and reporting activities with an increased focus on using reporting concepts such as materiality, stakeholder engagement, comparability, balance, context, timeliness, and reliability uh, to make ESG data more strategically useful for decision making by both management and stakeholders, including investors. Uh, Tamara, is that kind of consistent with what you're hearing from the respondents to the, the study that you produced? Yes, that, that, and that's one of the challenges as well, to, um, to tell the stories of the organization, but also to tell them in ways that uh, make sense to the more sophisticated investors who are comparing bottom line issues for these companies as well as the types of social responsibility activities that they're involved in. So Marianne, Amanda, how, how do you uh, feel about the the notion of the sustainability report? I, I continue to hear a lot of people say you know no matter what the organization reports they're sort of tooting their own horn and it's a it's a form of greenwashing uh, does it doesn't have to be though right right it's it's interesting you'd bring that up cuz i i uh, just read an article in the atlantic this past week and it, this is based on some research reported out of the journal of marketing about why companies do good and there was kind of two theories and one of them is they do good because they uh, believe it's the right thing to do or it's a good move for business overall by improving the overall financial performance of the company. The other theory is that uh, they, they do these things and report them in order to make up for past bad behavior. And, uh, and I think they're doing the independent reports from things I've looked at because they want to reach an audience other than investors. You know, they're, they're trying to reach not only the investor audience, but they're trying to reach those non-investors. But the consumers, as Tamara was talking about, millennials are becoming more discerning. A lot of people, not just millennials, are more discerning about the companies they will invest in based on their behavior as corporate citizens. And that involves not only sustainability, but also those those corporate good acts, how do they invest in the community in terms of education support and uh, literacy issues and, and all of those other uh, kinds of things that we look for in a, a well-rounded community. Great. And, and Amanda, you talked about the role of the communicator being uh, the people who are going to tell the story uh, or the stories of sustainability and, and other CSR activities. Is the report, whether it's an integrated report with the annual report or a separate document, is that one of the better opportunities to tell those stories? Uh, yes, it definitely is, but you know in South Africa we have the King 3 report and uh, according to the King 3 report it is uh, the integrated reporting is not you know something that organizations may do Existed, they must do it. So um, it is. It is uh, for me one of the reasons why there is this increase in corporate uh, integrated reporting because they must do it. And um, 
it's it's in to see how different different organizers do the um, integrated reports because some of them are really um, an interesting read and you they use a lot of graphics they use it in, they produce it in a way that um, this the various stakeholders be it investors be it can really um, read it and find valuable information in it. But unfortunately, some of these documents are still more inclined to be a um, financial report than a, a story that they tell. But I think some communicators really do a good job in um, getting the message out there in a way that uh, people will find it interesting. And John, I'm glad to see that you uh, were able to iron out those uh, those gnarly little tech issues. Welcome. Thank you. Apologies for being late. No problem. Uh, we started by going around and having everybody introduce themselves and uh, give their top line view of the role of communications in in CSR. So let's circle back to you and and have you tell everyone who you are and uh, offer that sort of an opening statement. Great, uh, John Debney. And I actually just finished my, my master's degree and my research looked on messaging strategies, specifically what were the most persuasive and compelling messages to, to win over C-suite leadership in selecting a corporate social responsibility program. And you know, there, while there were things that did not surprise me, there were also a lot of surprises. One of the things that really came out loud and strong is that putting together a corporate social responsibility program, the, um, the corporate partner wants to be more than just someone that can write a check. There were lots of things that they valued a great deal um, more than just being the finances behind a good cause. One of the things that really stood out consistently is that organizations want opportunities that their employees can engage in. They want to be able to give their employees opportunities to participate employees an, uh, an opportunity to also have a voice in what these programs do, how they do it, and for whom they serve. Well, that raises a lot of uh, fodder for discussion. Um, I, I read a book. Uh, I could look the name of the author up. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was called uh, Trust Me, PR is Dead. Um, and his I don't like it already. <laughs> <laughs> the the premise of the book was was really pretty simple. He said PR is what an organization employs uh, in order to clean up a mess or to spin uh, a, an organization story when the story isn't that great. He said that organizations that behave in a way that require PR to clean something up at the other end of a of an issue or a, or a challenge. Uh, aren't going to be around very long, uh, that we're in a much more transparent world uh, and much greater transparency is going to be required to do business uh, in the not so distant future and the companies that are going to still be around are going to be those that invest in causes, uh, those that you know make the world a better place whether it's a sustainability or uh, some other kind of social cause, um, and those stories tell themselves. You don't need PR to do that. I, I fundamental, uh, fundamentally disagreed. I even wrote a r review that uh, kind of slammed that. Is you know, if you hope the stories are going to tell yourselves, you're you're dreaming. Even if your organization is doing well uh, with these types of things, you you need somebody who knows how to get those stories told to the right audiences. Uh, but I guess the question I have to start with is, is it the role of communications to advise management that we need to exhibit these kinds of behaviors in the first place. I look back to the Melbourne mandate which seems to suggest it is that, that we're the keepers of, of the corporate values uh, and need to remind management of what we stand for uh, in, in order to pursue these kinds of activities. I feel strongly that, that it is the role of the communication professional to um, you know, remind the people that there, is a, there, there are values and the, the way the values are being lived by the corporate social responsibility needs to be told. Um, but again, um, my experience is that there are organizations that feel that 
they don't want to communicate about their corporate social responsibility because it will be regarded as whitewashing, greenwashing, you know, just trying to be printed with be this uh, good uh, organization. So they, they tell their people, no, we invest in this, we built the school, we built the clinic, but the people that will know, will know. We don't have to publish it even in the newsletters uh, for the employees. They refuse any reporting on that. And I feel, um, you know, that is also, um, you know, they, they're doing themselves a dishonor by not telling the people not to, to pretend that they're these goody goodies, but uh, just to say, well, we do care and we do these things because we are authentic in the way we do it. Can I, um, can I add on to what Amanda just said? Um, I think the days are gone where we, um, we should be hiding our light under the bushel, you know, the, um, that companies have to tell their stories because if they only come out in the end, as Shell alluded to from that, that book review, if they only come out in the end and start to say, oh, but we do these good things, it does look like they're hiding things. But if we accept the fact that corporate social responsibility should be the way that a company acts out its values on a daily basis, it should be a regular component of their culture and of their daily conversation. So it shouldn't just be something that, oh, we do this so people think we do good. And, and it shouldn't be something that they just do to, uh, to look um, like they're doing good for investors and, and people like that. It should represent their, their values, their mission, and, and be a regular component that all employees know about and participate in and take pride in. And I, I do think that the communicator is the corporate conscience of the organization. It's our role and responsibility to continually reinforce that we need to be transparent about everything, including our uh, our good deeds as, as well as those things we'd rather not talk about. I, my experience is if you've got an ongoing communication channel that uh, talks about the good along with the not so good, it really helps neutralize those bad bumps in the road that many companies hit on occasion. Right. Um, I, you know, Shell, I also think that when we're talking about either communication or communicators, we're talking about two-way communication. And I think the author of that, um, that mistaken book really only saw one part of it. They saw communication as, as the process of an organization speaking out to the communities and groups that are important to it. Possibly even more important is the role of the communicator and communication to allow the organization to be an attentive and productive listener so that they can hear um, what's important, what are the values of their community, what are the needs of the community, so that their actions, as Tamara so aptly said, are expressing their corporate values and demonstrating them in a significant way. It represents who the company is and, and what its purpose is, but also its appropriate role within society. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, the author of that book is Robert Phillips. He was a former president of Edelman, um, I think Edelman EMEA, um, it's 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 worth reading if you you know need your blood pressure raised. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, my fundamental problem was with his definition of of PR, but yeah, you know, I didn't disagree with his underlying premise that organizations are going to have to behave uh, with greater altruism and and, and bigger uh, social consciences. Uh, one of the things that the Edelman Trust Barometer points out is that people expect organizations uh, to commit some of their resources to efforts that are not going to produce ROI, uh, that are designed to uh, help contribute to making the world a better place. Uh, now, some of these might be sustainability efforts, but others could be controversial. I mean, if you look at Walmart, for example, a few months ago uh, when Arkansas was one of the states in the U.S. that was considering uh, a religious liberty law, uh, Walmart issued a statement 
uh, opposing the law. They wanted to make it clear that uh, in their stores they wanted to be able to welcome anybody, uh, not only people who pass some sort of religious test. Um, and you know that's taking a social stance, but at the same time it led some people on the pro-religious liberty side of that debate to call for boycotts of Walmart. So uh, my question is, from a communication standpoint, how do you help the organization take a stand on an issue like that, a social cause, a social justice issue, uh, with the recognition that there's going to be some blowback from some part of your stakeholder audience? I'll throw that to anybody. I'll give you another example while you consider it. Uh, Wells Fargo Bank uh, created an advertisement, a uh, television commercial, uh, that in the spot featured a number of different families, and one of them was uh, a uh, same-sex couple with a child. Uh, mm -hmm. And that led uh, uh, Bill Graham's organization, his son is running now, to withdraw uh, tens of millions of dollars from Wells Fargo. Uh, and uh, move it to a different bank uh, by way of protest. Um, again, a consequence. I have a feeling that they anticipated that and, and weren't terribly worried about it, and I was amused to find that the bank that they did deposit that money in is, is one that financially and otherwise supports, uh, I think it was the Atlanta Gay Pride Parade. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> Uh, a little bit of a stunner there, but um, nevertheless, I, I, I think a lot of organizations are reluctant to take these positions for fear of alienating uh, a part of their customer base. I'll, I'll, I'll wait in for just a moment. You know, my first thought is that when you're advising management about that kind of an issue, you have to remind them to look at both the short and the long term. You know, the short term uh, might have been some dropout of customers from uh, for Walmart, but long term, what's the probability that that's going to grow? What's the likelihood that those people who threaten or maybe actually do boycott Walmart for a while continue to do so? Um, you know, on the the other issues to to consider that you can't really be driven by the minority. That seems to be something that happens more and more in our society where the minority really is able to have an impact on the majority because nobody will ride out the controversy and let the minority do their ranting and raving and then go away. Right. There, there was another interesting case. I'm, I'm uh, struggling to remember which publication it was, but it featured uh, Gloria Steinem, uh, an interview. Uh, with her, uh, and as a consequence, they got uh, a lot of protests from people on the uh, pro-life side of the abortion equation, even though the issue of abortion never arose in the interview or in any of the content that was uh, published. Uh, so in response to the protest, they scrubbed the site of the entire interview. They couldn't do this in the, in the print publication. Uh, and uh, scrubbing the site of all of that content led to backlash from the uh, you know, the pro-choice uh, side of that debate. Uh, so they basically lost on, on both counts. I, I suspect part of the problem is that in planning to run this content, uh, nobody asked what could go wrong. Uh, how could people react to this in ways that we're not anticipating? I, I think that should be a component of CSR planning, especially when you're supporting uh, a cause or, or uh, an issue that has these um, kinds of complications where there are people opposed and, and, and people in support. Of course, you know, for something to be a cause, there has to be... Oops. <laughs> John just froze up. Yeah. I think he was going to say, uh, in order for there to be a cause, uh, there need to be people on two sides of the issue. Yeah, yeah. Would be my guess. Uh, by the way, we do have uh, people viewing this live, and we do have the uh, Q&A turned on, so if you have a question uh, that you would like us to uh, address here on the panel, just use that, that Q&A feature that you see on the screen, and uh, feel free uh, to share your question with us, and we'll see if John's able to get back with us uh, 
still frozen right now. Uh, yeah. But you know, in terms of this this issue that uh, was raised by the the Edelman Trust Barometer, uh, oh, John, you're back. Yeah. yeah um, so you have to recognize what's important and what are the priorities. Um, more and more companies, I think, are successfully doing this by listening not just to issues that are in the community, but also to the employees. One approach that's very interesting that I that we've seen companies do is find a, a good partner in a CSR program, identify where the employees already are. Are there charities or causes that a significant portion of your employees are already dedicating their, their dollars and their time to? Frequently, that's a better approach than a company just looking what is a popular topic or what is a hot trend. Right, and, and I was I was going to ask in in terms of the Edelman Trust Barometer's finding that people do want organizations to commit resources that won't generate ROI but will address these issues. Uh, how do we as communicators convince management to undertake that kind of an investment? Uh, up up in the C-suite, they're concentrating on ROI. They're concentrating on the bottom line. Uh, and siphoning off, say, 20% of, of the company's revenues for something that's not going to find its way back to shareholders uh, or back to reinvestment in the organization sounds to me like a tough sell in a lot of organizations. Um, I'll, um, I'll start on this one. Um, I think there are two um, concerns or two issues that I would raise, and one is the, the well of goodwill, right, that you are... Um, that every company needs that well of goodwill with their customers and their investors and their communities. And the, the second is that if, if large companies do not uh, reach out to their communities and provide some assistance, some of these problems won't get better, they'll get worse, and then that's going to have a negative impact on the company down the road. So wouldn't they rather be part of a solution, short or long term, than seen as someone who waited by the side uh, for a disaster to happen or for that to have a negative impact on their company, like um, a loss of uh, a population in a community to, um, to, to employ, uh, just as one example. Yeah, and Amanda, you were starting to say something, too. Yes. Um, to me, the, um, the crucial thing here is the intensity of the stakeholder engagement planning that they do. Because if the, the communication professionals really um, investigate this, both internal and external stakeholders, they will find common denominators that they can uh, explore to the benefit of the uh, you know, corporate social responsibility, but because they know the internal stakeholders as well as external, you can actually involve them in this corporate social responsibility. Because for me, again, it is this ability of communication professionals to rally people around an idea. And if you really get the community in the corporate social responsibility intervention, as well as the employees, and eventually, when the, when the organization leaves the community, they will be able to continue with the, uh, the project and not sit there and just wait for another intervention and another intervention. So for me, the core really of this is the communication professionals know what they need to say and who do they need to say that to leave a long-term uh, uh, reason. A any other thoughts before I throw another one out there at you? Okay. The, uh, the Sustainable Brands Organization has come out with its sixth annual Social Media Sustainability Index, which is focused on what companies stand for and how effectively they can communicate that sense of purpose. Um, and for 2015, uh, GE and Unilever uh, were at the top of the list. And uh, one of the things that they talk about is that they are uh, using 
product strategies in order to uh, support their CSR efforts. Uh, if you look at Unilever, for example, they own the Dove brand, uh, and Dove for several years has been focused on this real beauty effort. Uh, that uh, real beauty is not what you see on the cover of uh, the the fashion magazines or, or walking down the runways at, at, at the big fashion weeks. Um, and uh, that, you know, they're trying to put it into body shaming and, and, and things like this. Uh, is that a strategy where we as communicators can, can, can have an impact? And I'll, I'll throw one more at you that I just saw the other day. Uh, and this is from, um, I believe it's General Mills, uh, which makes Cheerios. And up in the, uh, their Canadian market, uh, on the box of cereal, uh, and if you've seen Honey Nut Cheerios, you know that there's a bee. Uh, that that is on the cover, sort of uh, flying above uh, a bowl of, of Honey Nut Cheerios. He's sort of a cartoon character. And in the packaging in Canada, what they have done is removed the bee. Uh, there's just sort of a white outline of that character where the, where the character used to be. And uh, they have a campaign they're running, bringbackthebees.ca. Uh, and this is all focused on the diminishing population of bees uh, worldwide and they're trying to raise awareness around that. Um, now this is packaging, this is, is, is marketing. Uh, where do we on the, on the corporate communications and PR side uh, have a role to play there? Anywhere from the, the creation of the idea um, to building awareness of what another part of the organization is doing? I think part of our role is, is to, to help companies be cautious that it's this is not just a marketing exercise. It's not just a gimmick. Uh, don't look for opportunities to purely advance the brand. I think Unilever and Natural Beauty makes sense. There was absolutely an issue there. Um, it's something that society does need to address. Uh, it, it certainly their product was in line with doing that, but also they did a lot of research. Um, they had a, a lot of female executive, female employees that talked about their own experiences. That was part of their internal listening process to make sure that that was good. I think part of, part of society recognizing that someone is a good corporate citizen is that it is altruism, that they're not just looking for a marketing gimmick to get some good media coverage or some social media play. Um, it's, it's not pick any cause, but really pick a cause that resonates with the communities that are important to you. You know, you were asking uh, the last question about giving away a percentage of profit. Well, one of the things that most companies struggle with most and their most important asset are their employees. If, you, if they can find an appropriate co corporate social responsibility program, and appropriate probably means one that resonates and is valued by employees, then suddenly they're, they're more than likely to see great strides in their ability to retain or attract the employees that make their company successful and profitable. It, it sounds like, John, what you're talking about requires a, a, an alignment between corporate values and employee values, which we know is one of the drivers of engagement, but also seems to be, uh, there, there seems to be some pretty large gaps in organizations based on some recent research. So getting employees involved in uh, and engaged in the company CSR activities requires that we know what they, their values are and that we're undertaking uh, CSR initiatives that are consistent with those. Uh, I, I know that in a lot of organizations, I, ju I just read a book about the Koch brothers, uh, Jane Mayer's book, Dark Money. And uh, they talked about, I think it was uh, Charles Koch, uh, gives a lot of the money from Koch Industries uh, to, I think it's the New York Ballet, uh, because he loves the ballet. I doubt very much that they've surveyed Koch Industry employees to find out if ballet is something that's important to them. Well, then, then is that really a corporate social responsibility program, or is that a personal donation by a single type of you know, while that is philanthropic and while the ballet is certainly a worthy group, I don't know that that really is a corporate social responsibility program as much as a donation from a single person not being attentive or listening to the communities that are important to his employees or to his customers. 
So you're distinguishing philanthropy from, from corporate social responsibility. Yes. While corporate social responsibility certainly can and should be philanthropic, there's a difference between a CEO making a gift and a company getting behind a cause or an issue. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It, it kind of tracks back for me, Shell, to the whole Cheerio issue. I'm not familiar with what's going on in Canada, but is General Mills contributing some financial support to research on why bees are dying? Or are they, are they doing something about it? Or are they just think it's a cute idea to say, gee, you know, the bee's gone and we got to get him back? Yeah, I, I, I read the piece about the, the packaging effort. I, I haven't delved in to see uh -huh. you know, what's beyond that, but I, I would imagine that they're uh, offering resources to people and letting know how, how they can help uh, on that um, website that they've set up just for the Canadian market. Yeah, well, I would think there'd be something on the package that would lead people to that site, I would hope, because as John said earlier, uh, you've got to have a tie between what marketing's doing and what is really of value to the community. And if that alignment's not there, it's a gimmick. Does there need to be a connection between the cause, and again, let's say we're not talking about sustainability, the environment, but some other social cause, and what your organization uh, does. Uh, for example, uh, there is um, a tendency among insurance companies to focus on health and wellness because if you're healthier, uh, it's going to reduce what they have to pay out in um, costs to, to cover treatments and, and, and illnesses. For example, Aetna has done a campaign around sleep uh, to improve sleep because their studies have shown that uh, inadequate sleep and bad sleep produce bad health health outcomes and therefore if we can help people sleep better uh, we're ultimately going to save money but we're at the same time improving the health and, and well-being of uh, people in our market. The alignment between a cause and an organization doesn't have to fit a, a single group's priority. So for example, um, I was just speaking to a colleague that's working with a company that they provide prenatal supplements to expectant mothers. And the cause that, that they're providing is for every package of prenatal supplements a mother gets, a uh, life package is sent to a third world country for a mother where um, due to infections during childbirth so many uh, infants and mothers are killed. So the packet has alcohol swabs and uh, scissors to cut the umbilical cord, strings to tie it, things that can stave off infections in third world country births. Clearly, they know that their customers are uh, expectant mothers and that they would have a natural empathy and priority to other women having a safe and healthy birth. On the other hand, you could be um, you could be a manufacturing company in South Florida building widgets. It could be that to your employees, hurricane preparedness is important. And it could be that the company supports hurricane preparedness for the, com for the physical community where its manufacturing plan is, for the community that its employees live, work, play, and pray. Might have nothing, their widgets have nothing to do with hurricanes or weather or preparedness. Their priority is is an audience, the audience of their employees and the community where their facility is based, the prenatal vitamin, the priority was to their customer base on the issue of a healthy birth. So it doesn't have to be with a single audience. It doesn't have to be important to employees or it doesn't have to be important to customers or it doesn't have to be important to the physical community you're in, but it needs to be important to at least one of them. I would add that it needs to also be uh, emblematic of the values that your organization has because just those examples that you gave show organizations that are empathetic to one of those audiences or to that, that concern, that issue. And, and if those are somehow driven by your, your mission, your vision, your values as a company, then some of those other audiences are going to come along, whether it's focused directly at them or not. 
Absolutely. And if instead a company tries to select a, a cause simply by what's trending now, that's, that is going to come across as tone deaf and be less successful. And, and John, you're, you're talking about that um, uh, prenatal. Oh, I'm sorry, Amanda, go ahead. Now, um, I just want to um, tell a story about what we have in South Africa. Uh, insurance, um, they started a pointsman service, which is a serious uh, corporate social responsibility intervention because um, there are so many traffic lights not working in Johannesburg and Pretoria at the moment that traffic is just a nightmare. So they saw the opportunity and they started this project. They created work for unemployed people. They trained them to be policemen and they're solving a traffic problem. And of course, there's a lot of stories to be told about that, uh, about the people they employ as well as the traffic, the problems that they're solving. So for me, we are getting a lot of visibility of marketing as a result of that. But um, I really don't have a problem with uh, corporate social responsibility that will impact a very positive on the organization because it is adding value. Yeah, I, I like the idea of the, the, the uh, undertaking a short-term defined uh, civic problem as opposed to a social justice issue or a long-term sustainability issue. I think that would draw a lot of attention. Um, but, um, John, you're talking about that prenatal uh, organization you worked with brought to mind organizations like Tom's Shoes, which for every pair of shoes they make, they, they send a pair to uh, impoverished people in, in third world countries that can't afford them. The same with Warby Parker for every pair of glasses they sell. Uh, they donate glasses to somebody who can't afford them in, in, in an impoverished area. Um, I think that's uh, a, a good ongoing approach uh, that shows that your company at its core is is committed to these causes, not on a short-term programmatic basis. Um, do you see a big difference between CSR programs and sort of something that's just baked into the operations of the organization? That's a great question. Um, ultimately, for it to be successful, corporate social responsibility programs need to, you know, as Tamara mentioned, needs to really be emblematic and reflective of the culture and who they are. Um, though we've also we've had examples where it doesn't have to do with the brand or the mascot or the product they build. Um, some of the research also pointed out that C-suite leaders also want an opportunity to stay engaged. They don't want to be this year's title sponsor to be forgotten by when next year someone else. So they want, they're looking for a longer term commitment, something that they can support. Um, it, it's interesting because in the research when leaders mention that, they also are attracted to things where they can see that they're making a difference, that there's a, that their contribution makes a real difference. Another match that they're looking for um, and, and this was a little surprising. They want to know, they want examples of how peer organizations have contributed or done things that truly made a difference. One of the things that came out, and in the research, we tested messaging strategy for a nonprofit client of ours and gave examples. Um, the, the nonprofit was very successful, and I know, uh, Shell, you mentioned Walmart before. One of the examples showed a partnership between the nonprofit we represented and Walmart. That actually turned out to be um, a turnoff. It, it was not persuasive or compelling for them because um, some of the some of the C-suite leaders said, "We're not the size of Walmart. We we don't compete with Walmart. And if someone as big as Walmart is involved." then maybe we're too small, maybe our contributions won't be significant, and, and looking for what is something that we can make a difference in that where we will be a significant contributor. So in looking for those partnerships, when a, a, a cause or a nonprofit looks to use examples of partner success, make sure that they're providing a peer solicitation, 
They're showing organizations or leaders that they can't either relate to or aspire that they they too would like to be like that. I uh, just want to remind people who are watching us live, uh, if you have a question, use the, the question feature here on the Google Plus Hangout on Air and toss it to us and uh, we'll answer it for you. But, um, <coughs> pardon me, we've, we've uh, talked about employees uh, quite a bit today um, and I know there are organizations that uh, engage their employees in CSR efforts. For example, uh, there are, are, are matching funds programs where if, if you donate X amount to uh, a, a charitable cause, we'll, we'll match that from the corporation. Uh, there are also corporations that support, act, uh, or, uh, support causes uh, through activities. For example, uh, say the uh, Susan G. Komen uh, breast cancer uh, walks. Uh, where the company will take an active uh, sponsor role and a bunch of employees will get out there with the uh, company t-shirt on with the, the Komen logo um, and show uh, employee support for the cause as well. Um, in the days of social media, you also have the opportunity for employees to share photos of themselves and their colleagues out for the walk on Instagram and, and Facebook and the like. Uh, how important is it that we activate employees as ambassadors or advocates uh, in their social communities in, in support of whatever initiative or cause is going on. And, and I ask this uh, in, in the context of another result of the Edelman Trust Barometer, one that has been true for years now, uh, and that is the frontline employees are, are viewed as more credible than official company spokespeople or company leadership. I think it is imperative that the employees are involved um, because otherwise the, um, I think it, it is not, it loses authenticity if it is just a small group that always go out and do these things and in South Africa we have a Mandela which is uh, 67 minutes that uh, organizations contribute to uh, do something for a community and the result of that each year is amazing. What big corporates do go out, they, they do wonderful things and the spirit, that, that uh, the engagement that that is into an organization is just amazing. So uh, for me it's, uh, you know, it's imperative that the employees must feel part of it and they must be, part, be able to participate in actually um, activating these uh, efforts. I think it's important also from the employee side, uh, Shell, in that employees, when their causes are supported and they're given that, that company time to engage in activities that are important to them, it says that the company cares about them more than just uh, how many <laughs> widgets they screw together or how many sales they make uh, and I think that's that's critical in terms of demonstrating that the company is about really supporting their community and, and therefore supporting their employees. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the connection between corporate social responsibility and crisis communication. Uh, big news last week was that SeaWorld, uh, the US-based uh, theme park, uh, announced that they were going to uh, put an end to their killer whale breeding program. It's been controversial for quite a long time, but really uh, skyrocketed as an issue in, uh, I think it was 2010, uh, when CNN uh, aired a documentary called Blackfish about uh, the consequences for the whales of this this breeding uh, program uh, that produced Shamu for you know performances in, in the Sea World shows. Uh, it so it took six years uh, for them to cave into the pressure, which is exactly what this is seen to be. Mitsubishi several years ago went through something very similar when they, after years and years and billions of dollars spent fighting the Rainforest Action Network finally caved in uh, and uh, changed their practices in terms of uh, 
you know, extracting resources from the rainforest. Uh, when these protests arise, shouldn't we play a role in suggesting that we uh, are probably going to lose in the in the court of public opinion in the long term, uh, and that it's going to be beneficial to the organization if we immediately embrace uh, these organizations and and find a solution uh, that 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 satisfies them. I mean, and there's there's tons of other examples. Uh, the the one that leaps to mind uh, right this minute is. Nestle, uh, with their rainforest practices and, and the campaign that was undertaken against them on their Facebook page, uh, which ultimately forced them to uh, find a new source for the palm oil that they were using, even though they were planning on making that change in a more deliberate way, uh, they were forced to uh, just find an alternative right now and implement it so that they could say that they uh, had listened and acted. You know, um, it's there's with crisis each situation is unique so there's not a cookie cutter fit but with SeaWorld shall I think you captured what conventional wisdom is that that they caved that they're no longer having these shows because the other side of, of the discussion was absolutely correct and what they were doing was wrong they will not get a lot of benefit from now doing because what it appears is they were always wrong the science and the arguments that they were presenting were not correct um, that they're not now stepping up and doing the right thing but they're caving to use your words and a crisis that that's been fascinating to watch is also Chipotle their approach is has been very different they brought in outside experts they they did several things very well and one of the things they're doing is is they're saying they are implementing new standards and practices that will make their restaurants the safest places to keep and will put their health and safety standards 15 years ahead of every other um, QSR quick service restaurant or even dining establishment they're they are really taking a position that they're going to advance not just their company but the industry and the safety for every diner by doing this. One thing that they did poorly though is um, during the course of it they reported that there were um, four incidents and 510 people were reported as sick. The media reported that there were six incidents and 545 people that were sick. I mention that because any discrepancy there, any any difference, the public is going to question, are they lying, are they hiding, who's telling the truth? Um, so what I like what Chipotle did, I, I like a lot of what they did and how they did it, and part of it is they said, we're not just going to fix our situation, we're going to make things better for everyone, which was much more forward thinking, much more valuable, and will ultimately um, serve them better SeaWorld, I think, is an example of the other side of that. That they're not, I don't see them getting a lot of support or attendance based on this new decision. Yeah. I think we also have to look at some of those smaller companies and how crisis can affect them and how corporate social responsibility can or cannot have an impact. I did some work for a Minnesota based nursing home. Uh, skilled nursing, senior living community uh, that took over management of a facility in Yuba City, California, kind of north of north of your neck of woods, between you and I, Shell. Right. And they had when they took over management, they did not go in and make any friends in the community, so they had no they had no good PR. They had no corporate social responsibility. They just went in and started. Uh, taking names and, and kicking butts, so to speak, and they got slaughtered in that community because they had nobody that said, wait a minute, they're trying to clean up a mess that the state of California was going to close this facility because it was so poorly run. That was all forgotten, and they ended up with um, 29 lawsuits filed against them by some uh, hippie attorney who is a fallen away corporate litigator from Chicago that had moved to Oregon House to a commune of some sort for wrongful death or wrongful termination 
and all of the wrongful death suits that he got family members to file, their loved one who had died in this facility had advanced directives. The persons were basically in hospice care. They were dying anyway, and they got totally slaughtered, and it was a four-year project. They had no friends in the community. I made a bucket load of money <laughs> trying to bail them out of this issue that if they had just had some good diplomacy and good due diligence when they went in to take over. They didn't meet with the mayor. They didn't meet with faith community leaders. They didn't meet with health department people. Nobody. They just went in and started like a bull in a china closet uh, taking over. It was you're on the bus or you're in front of the bus and you're out. So I think if long-term corporate social responsibility programs are genuine, they're ongoing, when something bad happens, I do think it helps moderate it some. I don't think you could come in and start a program when it's um, already damage has been done. Yep. Let's. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so uh, let me throw out one last question to you, and it's a, a core question for communicators and. That is, and recognizing that it's going to be different in, in, in different organizations and, and for different kinds of causes, but how do you tell the stories about our CSR efforts, our client CSR efforts, in a way that is genuine and authentic and doesn't seem forced or like we're trying to toot our own horn? Uh, how, do, how do we tell? I, mean, I, 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 I There was a great sustainability story out of, out of Frito-Lay, uh, in Ireland, in one of their uh, potato chip pr processing plants, what they were doing was capturing the steam from boiling the potatoes uh, and using that, they were converting it back to water and using it to water the lawns uh, so that they weren't taking any public water supply uh, for you know, watering the lawns in, in front of the facility. Uh, I read about that and some of the other CSR efforts out of Frito-Lay and, and PepsiCo uh, in a Business Week article. So I don't know whether that was something that, that a Business Week reporter tackled themselves or if it was a, a good example of media relations placing that story, uh, but it was highly credible because it was coming from a, a third party. Uh, what, what are the best ways to tell these stories? Um, if I can uh, jump in on this one. Uh, in the uh, in the study that I did with two of my students over the last two years, we looked at corporate blogs as a and and the social media coming out of um, corporations and what they're what they're sharing. And we found that the organizations, some of them that we've actually talked about today, like um, GE and uh, Procter and Gamble and Unilever and organizations like that, take the time to tell these stories on a regular basis um, in a dedicated corporate corporate blog as well as in their other social media that are very easily accessible to the public at large both the media and uh, consumers employees and um, we found in our in our research our surveys with um, with our population that consumers and investors found these very credible and accessible um, especially when the corporation was telling both the good stories as well as some of the negative stories like um, crises um, and how they were dealing with um, environmental issues and things like that that are in inescapable um, in today's mass media so why not you know take take ownership of the story and tell your side okay. John any thoughts on how best to tell these CSR stories you know what you what a company wants to have is someone else cheering for them and someone else praising and and lifting them up with praise that's a good that's a good thing to look at when you're forming and selecting a partner for this you know is is the um, is the nonprofit or cause partner that you're selecting do they have connections with communities that are important to you also putting in the beginning how they're going to communicate things who they'll communicate it with you know that's important in selecting a partner because the best way to get it across is for someone else to lift you up with praise for someone else to point the light on you and say here's a great example of a company that's not just doing well financially but doing good for the community 
and serving all of us in society. So especially in a CSR program, you have the opportunity to select a partner that will tell that story for you, that will bring others' attention to the good works that you're doing. Amanda, how about you? Any thoughts on the best ways to share these stories? Um, definitely the beneficiaries, um, because uh, that also proves that it is a sustainable project. Uh, if they can tell the story of three years ago, this was where I was, and as a result of this intervention, this corporate social responsibility project, this is where I am at the moment. Uh, for me, that is definitely the most credible one, and uh, we, for various organizations, we do that in their newsletters, be it electronic or uh, printed newsletters, because that also carries the message back into the organization so that the people can see, well, the organization is actually better with busy with sustainable projects and not uh, once off uh, projects everywhere that really does not have any sustainability. And Marianne, we'll wrap up with you. Well, I, I, I think Tamara and uh, Amanda have both said it well. If you can get the beneficiary to tell your story, if you can get that third party, as John says, to tell your story, it's much more palatable than if you're trying to tell it. So you need to encourage and train your nonprofits that you work with, for example, that it's okay to ask the beneficiaries to tell their stories. Some of them I've worked with in the past have been very reluctant. And I've said they can always say no. And they found that they never said no. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd add that I think visual communication probably has a role to play here too. Uh, if you can take pictures of tangible things and share those out through, say, Instagram or you know these days even even Snapchat, um, even Facebook, uh, with with the focus on uh, a visual as opposed to the narrative where you're patting yourself on the back. Um, that, that kind of a tangible look at something not only transcends language barriers, but uh, it, it shows material um, activity. So I think that's another thing to look at. But we are out of time. I uh, want to thank everybody uh, who was watching live for joining us today uh, and thank the panel. Amanda, John, Marianne, Tamara, really appreciate your uh, insights today. Uh, for everybody watching, this will be available as a YouTube video shortly and as an audio podcast. If you go to the FIRpodcastnetwork.com, uh, you'll be able to download it there or subscribe so that you can be sure to get all of the episodes of Circle of Fellows. And we'll be back next month with another topic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Bye-bye.